I'll, I'll say hello. Hello, everybody. <laughs> we are professionals. We are. We've done this before and everything. Mm. So you were expecting to learn about how to perform seriously? Do you want my backbone? No. I Whoa. Want, I want a power lead that stays plugged in. There's one here too? No. Which is coming unplugged? It's this beastie here is. Okay, let's live on the edge. Let's do it this way. Oh. Boop. Are we gonna start in the code spaces anyway? They we, saw that. Let's do that. Oh. So we're going to start by... Oh, for, <laughs> Lucky your mic fell off right when you swore. That's automatic bleeping right there. Don't even need, don't need assistance. So we're going to start... I see code spaces. I s yeah. Yeah. You know what I've done? You've turned your monitor off. Yeah. Cool. That's really cool. <laughs> Computer. So let's start at the beginning. Jess and I were doing a training day and we have hundreds of people turning up. And what we want them to do is to be able to follow along. And what we don't want to do is spend all of our time chasing problems with their machines. So we gave them an environment like this where we can literally say, hey, yeah, just start the profile and start a session. And when the session starts, it's going to come up. It's going to say, hey, Joshua, shall we play a game? Which film is that from? Yeah. Bloody hell. You said that without moving your lips. Or, or you've got a mask on. Right. I was going to say, you can't even see his lips. <laughs> so we say yes. And then Pac-Man comes along, takes it away, says, choose your game. Uh, it doesn't really matter now. The point is, from our training day, is that we can go, well, let's just pick, uh, pick number three. I think I picked number three. And we have a little description. What's this will say? Uh, entering the chapter carefully, the players realize that it all looked the same. It's almost like it had been copied over. Copy, copy, copy. And then the tests are running because we are good presenters and we make sure we pester check our environment before we start going. And um, we failed some tests, but that's okay because this is just a demo. So you can see how everybody, the experience that everybody had was just to open up an experience. This is running in code spaces. This is running in a browser, well, it's running in a browser app on GitHub somewhere else. And it literally has two SQL Server instances that we've just created for anybody to work. So that's cool. It's magic. That, that is cool. But how did we do it? Will we? Oh, look at that. It worked. Do you see that? Look I did it. That. I pressed next. Go. You'll go. Thank you very much, people who gave money to the conference so that we could have a conference. We are very grateful. This is me. Uh, my name's Jess Pumfret. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm a data platform architect for data masterminds. Uh, I'm passionate about automation, proper football, and fitness. My accent's a little strange, but I am English, so I like the football with the, the feet and the ball, not the football with the hand and the egg. Uh, the most important information on this slide is in the bottom corner and is my contact information. Uh, if you have questions or you wake up in the middle of the night and you want to talk about DBA tools, containers, things like that, find me on Twitter. We also have... Uh, my name is Rob. My pronouns are he and him. I am a consultant that goes in and helps people to make stuff go. I'm generally in the data platform world, but it's, it's all automation to me. Um, same thing applies. Make sure that you 
know how to get in touch with me, SQL DBA with Beard on Twitter is the best way. If you have any questions, please feel free to come up and ask. And you're looking at half of the authors of DBA Tools in a Month of Lunches, which is under that flag over there. Oh, um, is that a yeah, sign? Yeah, yeah, I think you should. Go yeah. get it. So my, myself and Jess and Chrissy Lemaire and Claudio have written a book. And there, 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 there is the actual book. And this real is like super exciting because now it's 24 hours that we've actually had real actual paper. Would you like to touch it? It's real. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Yep, your name is in it, absolutely, as a, as a, as a reviewer for which we're, we're mm. most grateful. Awesome. So, uh, click. Click. So the other thing to say about Jess and I is not only do we do training together, not only do we write books together, we like to go cycling together. But there's an important part here. We are not a couple. We each have our own wives. So SQL Biz 2022. This is a data platform event in the UK. It moves around every year, in theory, every year, uh, to different venues. In 2022, it was a hybrid event in London. A hybrid being we had some people online, some people in person, because obviously, gestures are everything. The last couple of years, we haven't been able to have in-person events. And so this first event back for SQL Bits, they went for a kind of a hybrid approach. We're talking about a, a couple of thousand attendees um, coming together and learning about data platform, SQL Server, Azure, SQL, all that good stuff. And it's five days long. So you've got a number of different days. You've got days with full day, full training day sessions. You've got days with one and a half hour sort of sessions. And then Saturday is always a free day with sort of hour long sessions that everybody can come along and some lightning demos and stuff. Product group are there, MVPs are there, experts from all over the world. And so me and Rob decided that we were going to do a training day, a full day of learning about SQL Server, specifically with DBA tools, how we can make SQL Server administration easier with PowerShell and DBA tools. This was the abstract that we submitted. Uh, and we ended up with about 30 in, peop in, in people, in people, in person attendees in London and 70 remote attendees uh, online, all interacting together and using our kind of environment that we've built to give this training day. And this was my face. Ah. Uh, it is Joey's face, but I was pulling the same sad Joey face. So then I got this. Hey, uh, test is po positive. So now we're not just, we're not just doing a session with 70 remote attendees and 30 in-person attendees and one presenter in person and one presenter Locked remote. Locked in my office. It added a whole other level of complexity. And actually, because of the way we developed all of this, it really worked out quite well. It did. So what we wanted to do, like I just said at the beginning, was we wanted everybody to have the same experience. And that's really hard. I've done it before with, with a few hundred people in a room. And I've tried it with containers, and I've tried it with VMs that we created in Azure. And there's always something that's going to be difficult. There's always a corporate lockdown on the laptop, or somebody doesn't have the right version, or the Wi-Fi is too slow, or the dog ate my homework, or whatever it might be that's made this difficult. Um, and even in the development experience where Jess and I are both working on the same lump of code together, turns out Jess likes different extensions in her VS Code environment than I do. Which then means the experience for the attendees is different as well. So we decided to kind of get around this problem of by creating a dev container. So First things to think about when we're, we're talking about a dev container is our local development environment, right? I've got my laptop at home, and I've got VS Code installed. I've got it set up just the way I like it, right? I've got a cool theme, I've got some nice extensions, and I've got my source code that I am working on and trying to share with Rob. We're trying to both work on the same folder of code uh, kind of in parallel. With a dev container, we can then connect, connect to a container as a remote server to basically develop in that remote server environment we'll mount our source code into that container. So all of the things, all of the code files, or the PowerShell is, is in that container for us to play with. And we can also configure our environment as code in a kind of script that we'll look at in a second. But we can say, like, 
when this code, uh, when this dev container opens, these are the extensions that should be installed. This is the look and feel. This is how it's going to work uh, within the container. So me and Rob could share this repo. And when we opened it as a container, we got the same experience, the same code, the same extensions. So I think that's, that's important is that not only was, were we creating the thing for our attendees to have the same experience, we were actually developing within that environment with exactly the same experience, no matter whether we had COVID or not. Right. <laughs> So this is our dev container JSON file. And basically what you do to create a dev container is you whack one of these JSON files in your repository. And with the magic of this, oh no. Go back, top one. I didn't hold it. There we go. With the magic of this, uh, we can create our environment. And as I said, configuration is code. We're gonna save this in the repository. And when you open it, this is what you're gonna get. So first thing to look at is we've got our workspace folder. And that is where our source, our uh, code, our source is going to get mapped into the container. So we're going to work out of that folder. We're also going to have the service, so DBA Tools 1. That's where we're going to end up. That's where we're going to work from. And again, we mentioned the importance of extensions. Uh, so these are the extensions that we said were necessary for this project to work. And we've got some things that work on. Uh, rainbow brackets to make your brackets line up more easily. We've got some uh, Git graph in there. We've got error lens. We've got all of the things that we use to get this kind of overall uh, similar environment. But what we needed is more than one container because the beauty of DBA tools is that you can run a command against a whole bundle of SQL instances and you're going to get a decent experience. So if we want to teach all day about working with this, then we want to be able to use multiple instances. We want to be able to copy things between them. So how are we going to achieve that? Just a bit of Docker Compose. Who's comfortable with using Docker Compose? Just a few of you. So what Docker Compose is going to do is going to say, this is how I would like you to build my environment. So if we have a look up at the top, we've got a DBA tools precon, just a little bit higher. There we go. That's our image. So we've got a certain image that we're going to create as our container. That is going to be DBA tools one. That's our, going to be our entry point for our environment. It's where we're going to have our PowerShell. And then below that, we're going to have DBA tools precon two and that one is going to be another SQL instance with SQL running for us to be able to connect to. And then we have some shared um, directories to enable us to transfer files between the two using volumes in our um, Docker environment. And that's, we're going to make, then, 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 no, that's cool. We can Ready? Go. Yeah, yeah. Because what we're going to do is we're going to make this. Uh, that, Rob, this was just our practice drawing. You said you were going to make it pretty. Oh, okay. Well, just click again. Okay. Oh, there, there we go. So <laughs> we decided to keep that in because it just made us laugh. The, the, this is what we're making. So the blue square is our entire environment. It's created by our Docker Compose. It's what's going to be when our dev container starts up. This is what it's going to create. And we've got DBA Tools 1. That's a SQL instance. And it's where our PowerShell session is going to be. And then we have DBA Tools 2, which is going to just be running SQL, and we're going to be able to connect between two of them. And it's going to be the same whether we're running it, as you saw, in a browser, in a browser app on my Windows machine, running Windows 11, Windows 10, anything else that could run Docker. On a Mac, on an iPad, I ran it in a browser on an iPad just because I wanted to see if I could. So it literally reduced the complexity of getting all of our audience able to have the same environment. But now we're working on our, um, working on our code and our training day. And, and, you know, we're not animals. We don't want to be manually updating things. So we use GitHub Actions. There it is. There it is. We've got to do the Zoom again, folks. You've got to do the Zoom again. All right. So this is kind of our development workflow, right? As Rob said, we like to automate things. We're not going to manually do our own things. Uh, so we, at the bottom, we've got our uh, dev container running on our local laptop, right? And we're going to be developing here. 
each individually in our houses, working on our code. Now, when certain things change within that repo, we're going to need to update things so that we can get the newest version, right? So we push those changes up to GitHub. And depending on uh, which files were changed, GitHub Actions will, oh dear, <laughs> I was looking at you. <laughs> GitHub Actions will uh, fire off uh, this workflow for us. So changes to our Docker file, changes to our profile, and changes to the PSM1. We made our own module as part of this repository. Um, changes to those meant we needed to rebuild our containers. So GitHub Actions went across and pushed our new uh, images, our new tags, over to Docker Hub ready for us consumption. Now, they also uh, pushed updates back to our repo to let us know there was a new version of that container, right? So the dev uh, container JSON that we looked at earlier has the, the docker or the image and the tag that we need to be able to run this dev container. So it updates that dev container dot JSON, pushes those changes uh, back into our GitHub repo, which then, depending on which one of us did it, we get the little pop-up uh, on our machine, right, that says there's a change upstream that we need to pull down. We pull that local change down. Now, that's not just what you think of, oh, the little circle with a one saying that there's a new, uh, a new commit to be made. Actually, in the dev container, if you're working, it will pop up and it will say, hey, looks like your, your code space has changed configuration. Would you like me to rebuild it for you? So we could be working together on a Teams meeting or just chatting. Jess would make a change, push it up, it would fizz around and do all of that. And then on my machine, hands off, it would just pop up and go, hey, I'm being helpful. Would you like me to just rebuild this for you? Yeah, great. Click. And I'd automatically get everything that came through with even less thinking than, than was needed. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So that next time that we build that, uh, rebuild that container, it will say, I don't have the latest image. It'll pop off to the Docker Hub and pull down the image for us. Yes, far away. Why does PowerShell out of date if you automated all that? Why is PowerShell out of date? In the screenshot? No, yeah, yeah. Or in the code space? In the code space, yeah. Because of the base um, image that we're yeah. using. You can blame Chrissy. It's all, Chris, it's all Chrissy Lemaire's fault, fault, and that's recorded. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the reason that, um, that the PowerShell was out of um, uh, an, an outdated version is because the base DBA tools image that we were using to create all of this hadn't had that updated. So we could have updated it, or we chose to just leave it where it was. Cool. So that was our workflow. And this is how you write uh, the, work, the workflow. We used GitHub Actions for, for our pipeline. And you can see up here uh, at the top, we've got a couple of options for when this should run. So based on a, a push or a pull request to the certain files that I mentioned, uh, this GitHub Action will be invoked. We also added the workflow dispatch, uh, which means that we can run it manually from within GitHub, right? If we come down, you then see we've got some certain steps uh, that are available. How do I just get rid of that without? Oh, oh, there we go. Let's go back. There are some certain steps that we run through uh, every time this is invoked. The one at the bottom of the screen here is the bump version and push tag, which is a really cool uh, step that allowed us to create that next uh, image version for our containers. Then we carry on along our pipeline, building and pushing our containers. There's two steps for that. Uh, you can see there we're using GitHub secrets to save our credentials. Uh, obviously, we don't want passwords and usernames and stuff in our code, so we make use of GitHub secrets for that. We've then got two find and replace steps. As that image uh, is updated on Docker Hub, we need to update our dev container, uh, our Docker Compose YAML file with that new version number. So we find that in the file, replace it, and then finally add and commit, commit that back to our repository with the new image number in it. And enable us to have some fun. Because, you know, we want to have some fun. So you see, we've done our Shala, shall we play a game from World Games? We've done a choose a game because the conference was arcade themed. 
we wanted to bring a bit of fun to it, but it enabled anybody to go through and pick which chapters they wanted to do. They wanted to learn in a different order, or they wanted to, to just go back and revisit something. They could just start this code space up, choose a different number, and away you go. And even better, for those of you who know the film, it enabled us just to do some silly things. So one of the things that happens in the film is you teach the computer to play tic-tac-toe. The computer goes around and around and around and goes, well, you know what, actually this is just this is just a silly game because the only way to win is not to play. So we could throw in all of this fun as well. Now, we could give you lots of demos, we could show you lots of code, you can ask us lots of questions, but we also thought that maybe the thing that would be quite fun, because this is a how did we get from where we were to this place, is that we would send, take you through a journey of our commit history. Wait, are you going to talk about this one? No, I'm not going to talk about this one. What about this guy? Oh, okay, I'm going to talk about this one. <laughs> this is when Seek managed to break all of our demos. Seek, Seek is a cat. Uh, I, Seek is not, not, not the first time that Seek has been involved in the PS Conf EU. In fact, uh, the last time we ran, he was in some videos with, with me. Um, and he likes to sit on my desk. Uh, and this particular time, he also liked to hit the hash key. And that one little hash probably cost both of us about 45 minutes. Thank oh. you, Seek. Why, why did this, why, why is this not working? What has been broken? So as you can see, the commit message says this one hash, that's all it takes for Seek to ruin everything. So we shall, uh, maybe, perhaps, we'll have a, one of those. It should give us one of those, which means I can show that. A wise man can learn more from a foolish question and a fool can learn from a wise answer. So be like the app and ask questions, please, whenever you feel necessary. Don't be polite to put your hands up. Just shout out a question and we'll see what we can, we can do. But Rob, what you need to do is you need to click the link over here because otherwise you're not going to get to the right place. Oh, and even better, it's not actually a link. Good work. It's almost like I'm a pro. Um, so, what's the first thing we're going to talk about? Starting to move towards modules and using our PS default parameter values. So, as we, were, as we were developing this, we were trying to make it as easy as possible, right? As repeatable as possible, so people would open this dev container and get this experience that we expected. Because there's nothing worse than going on to do a demo and someone's like, oh, mine isn't working. And then us trying to spend time getting them up to speed. Because we wanted people to learn, we wanted it to be interactive. So we started using things like PS default uh, parameter values uh, to be able to make connecting to our containers easier. We also created this Jess and Beard PSM1 uh, module within our environment. Did you have a question? No, okay, sorry. Uh, which we then started to use. We started to reuse our code as we talked about in the keynote yesterday. Was that yesterday? Yeah. I think it was uh, only yesterday. It's been a long two days. Uh, so that we could start removing things that we had repeated, right? Like each one of our chapters, I think if you scroll down. Uh, uh, it's not in here. Because is it on the next one? So each one of our containers, we had this connection information, right? And making sure that our connections were working, which we could just module, uh, put into our module and reuse. Yeah, so then you've, you've, you've done the next yep. bit already. So, yeah, so this so. is us just cleaning up, right? So Removing the things and putting them all into a module so that we could use it over and over again. But this also led us to find a bug in DBA tools because as we were doing this, we had the same parameter names. We found that uh, one or two of the commands had destination credential instead of destination SQL credential. So in true open source fashion, we filed a bug with the DBA tools module. Someone came along, did some uh, additional kind of checking and found a couple other commands that we're using non... Uh, Hang on a minute, I went through. Oh, you did the additional <laughs> checking? Someone else <laughs> someone, did some, some additional checking. Else, yeah. okay, someone okay. else with a beard came along and went, Hang on a minute. 
I've gone and had a look, and it seems like when we got to version one of DBA tools and we had everything consistent, we didn't quite have everything consistent. Surprise. So we had these um, three other commands that had destination credential when everything else was using destination SQL credential. And I'm like, hey, look at all of these. And then it's proper open source because give them some steps to reproduce. This is all I did. Yep, we're running the latest release. These are the versions of SQL, of PowerShell, of Windows that I'm using. Um, and Sean came along and went, yep, you don't know how to name an issue, which is, which is fair. Um, and then also came and said, yeah, absolutely. Some of this is absolutely what we need. But actually, um, when Sander, who sat there, uses um, invoke command, Two in invoke DBA DB log shipping, we probably don't want to be a SQL credential. This actually should just be our destination credential. So we'll take that one away. So that was cool. Andreas came along with some, some more examples. And then he wrote the code to fix it. Chrissy merged our um, change in. Excellent as well as being able to provide training and do all the things, we're also contributing back into the open source community. And okay, this time it was DBA tools, which we love and would do anyway. But this is the point of, of how you work with open source within, with, whilst doing corporate things. Both of us work as consultants for a company, go into other places. And part of that work sometimes is actually fixing, raising bugs with open source projects to help improve the work that we're doing as consultants, which makes money for our companies. This is this sort of circular, circular thing. Um, so with DBA checks, we found uh, DBA checks is a system module to DBA tools, enables you to use Pesto, it's a wrapper around Pesto to check um, SQL instances as we expect. So we could then put these in front of any of our uh, chapters. So that bit at the beginning when you saw a chapter and you saw some code coming through, then it's actually running um, Pester in the background to make sure that our containers are set up as they're right for each container. So that's useful for us when we're doing our training to make sure our environment is exactly right. It's useful for our attendees because if you ever do training, you'll find there'll be some attendees in your session who will go ahead and go click it off and doing other things and breaking their environment. And what we didn't want to do was spend any time fixing that. So it meant that they would then have that experience. They'd start the chapter, the test would automatically run, and if they fail, then it's going to tell them, hey, this is what is, what is wrong here. But with DBA checks, we don't just have set checks. We have configuration for the checks. We also have the ability just to write your own checks in and put them in. So there we go. We've got some, some checks here. These databases should not exist. Um, We'll fix all of those and make sure that we've got some DBs available on our instance. So here we are. I think as we went, we just kept down adding these checks, right? Our kind of development process was for us to add a chapter. This is what that chapter should look like. Add in some, add in some checks, making it more robust kind of with every day that we were developing this. So here's a problem with dev containers that you may or may not hit. Because the point of this presentation is not to talk about how wonderful DBA tools is and how you should be using it, because you should. It's actually to say, this is how we did this with dev containers, but we didn't just build an environment in a single container. We were using two containers, which is really cool. It's really amazing. And it will really screw you up at some point in time. Because when we do that magical thing of rebuilding our container, it brings everything back up. Or we shut our you know, we stop working and then we, we move on. What happened was that dev container one, DBA tools one, would be thrown away and then would come back up again. DBA tools two would be thrown away apart from the volumes that it had and then it would come back up again. So those checks that we've written to say shouldn't, should have databases on, or should not have databases on DBA tools too, are failing because it's coming back up still from the last time we were testing. 
So this led us down a little journey of fun and joy. Oh, it was joy. a journey. So um, I thought it was a Docker Compose. A stupid Docker Compose didn't know that actually I wanted to be updated, to, to do the thing, please. Um, I was like, no, that's, that's not working. So we went into the notes. Uh, yeah, not bonkers, just, just, just forgetful, because um, that what we've got to do is you've got to do this. And this is important, because what, if you know how to use Docker, you know you're using Docker Compose, then you'll know that you can just do a Docker Compose dash F to the file name, and then you can do a down. Except that that doesn't work if you started a dev container. Because the dev container gives it a project name, and this time it's bits dba tools underscore dev container. So you have to specify that. If you don't specify that, Docker Compose goes, I don't know. So this is what we had. Sat around for a while. Um, we carried on trying, or is that still trying? Is that the one we did? Yeah, just trying to get it to recreate uh, and, and failing. So we tried the old latest tag. Nobody's laughing at me because latest tag means nothing. It's just a tag name. Doesn't mean the latest tag at all. Deliberately put in as a joke, but no, oh, okay. So then we had the bump version and tag. So this is where we've now gone and picked up the, um, the GitHub action that is going to then say, right, what I'd like you to do is do default minor version bump every time that we run this um, uh, action so that we can get a new version, which will then update the dev container with the latest tag. And that's bound to work, isn't it, Jess? Oh, yeah, this will definitely work. Yeah. Um, Spoiler alert, there's more commits after this. Uh, guess what? It worked. It worked? Does it say it worked? It, yeah, absolutely, it definitely worked because look, we've got this. Yeah, it almost looks like it worked. So it worked because the GitHub action has fired when we've done a commit and it's updated the version name. Uh, yeah, but we actually also need the the, the image name as well. Rob. Um, so as, as well as the version name, let's, let's have the image name. So we need to replace our, our image name. All right, so that's definitely going to work. Definitely going to work? Uh, yeah, definitely going to work, apart from uh, them commits that come after. Oh, OK. So um, we had to do the same with the second image, because I forgot that there were two images, cause, because I don't know why. Uh, there we go. So now we're definitely going to work, because now what we've got you see, we've got a new version committed, and now this time it's put the double quotes on both sides, because that was the, the thing that was actually falling us over. So now it, it's definitely going to work, right? Definitely going to work? Yeah, it's definitely going to work apart from here, because here what it did was it, um, for some reason that I literally couldn't work out, is it stole this um, double quote as well, which I was convinced that I'd, I'd fixed. So this time, right, I, like, definitely, definitely, definitely going to work. Um, it's gone we again, went Rob. through all of this pain so that you don't have to. Okay? And we're already up to version 9. <laughs> if we did version 9, we've not actually, actually, actually done anything. Right, so we're going to ditch the quotes. Ditch the quotes altogether. No quotes. Take the quotes away. Oh, no, that's actually not worked either. Because, no, there we go. This is the commit message from our GitHub action that has updated our versions, updated our dev container, updated our, de our reference in our dev container, updated our Docker Compose. This is our automated message. And now we've gone, we don't need any quotes. So don't worry about the quotes here for your, for your Docker Compose, even though you'll see them in all the images. Actually. You, they're, they're just not needed. And it makes life so much easier than trying to pass the quotes, which just, just face that. So Jess, what happens when you're running a PowerShell session mm. and inside that you've got another run space that connects to a container that doesn't have a credential and default parameter? Yeah, it just, it just explodes. Blows the thing away. So this was another thing that we found as we were working on this in that some of the demos that we were writing, obviously we've done a lot of presentations on DBA tools before, so we were kind of reusing code that we'd already written. And we found that 
in some of the code I added in to this one, I was specifying a SQL credential as I passed it in, right? Um, so we already have the, the credential saved as our PS default parameter values, if you remember that from a little earlier. So now we've specified the credentials twice, which apparently just in most PowerShell sessions, uh, specifying it will overwrite the PS default parameter value, right? In our dev container, the whole PowerShell thing just dies, which is not really useful because you're halfway through a demo and you're trying to show, show how cool DBA tools is, and then you lose everything. And you'll see the same thing if you're running uh, Azure DevOps or GitHub Actions, mm -hmm. and your uh, PowerShell session is requiring a remote, um, a remote input. You're going to get that same sort of um, idea. So sometimes if you run GitHub Actions or you run Azure DevOps and you're connecting in PowerShell and the PowerShell just crashes and you're not getting anything back, and you're like, well, why is that happening? Try running the PowerShell against that thing. And if you're getting an error locally, there's something along the lines of um, remote session required an input. That's probably what's happening when you get it remotely. It's just you're, you're not actually catching those errors and being, having them displayed to you. So we actually learned a ton ourselves about run spaces, about GitHub Actions, about dev containers as we were working through building this training day for something completely unrelated, really, right? I mean, the goal was to teach people about DBA tools, and we taught ourselves a ton about yeah. dev containers, which was Absolutely. super cool. So after a whole bunch of development work, you can imagine there was stuff everywhere. So it was time for a quick cleanup. So Jess had said that we'd stolen, used, reused code that we'd had from other demos. So, you know, obviously, what you need to do is you need to write the GERT a, big delete. A commit message is GERT big delete commit. GERT is southern, southern western United Kingdom slang for a lot or great or... Real big. GERT big. It's GERT big, isn't it? No. So we, we did, we deleted, I don't know, 105 files. So it, yeah, nice. Deleted a whole load of stuff. Make it, made um, it real nice and tidy. Absolutely. That's absolutely going to be perfect. Um, except if you delete the, um, the Docker file as well. And then you have to write a message that says, nothing to see here, ladies and gentlemen, move along. This does not concern you. Because... Turns out everything was broken again, and this time it wasn't Seek. Yeah, it wasn't Seek. It was just, just, a, just DBA tools. And then, you see, this conference was happening early March. And we've been doing this since... November. And War Games is about thermonuclear war. So all we did have at some point in time was, oh, don't fool for me now, Wi-Fi, please, is in our Shall We Play a Game, we had, why did that not go to where I wanted it to? Jess, too close to home. There we go. So in our options, what we had, oh, it's gone. Yes. Oh, man. One more time. No, gone. Uh, what we had was um, a game called Thermonuclear War, because it was funny in January and February, because it related to the film, teaching the the film to have the game. And then, you know, the world collapsed in this strange way that we've got in happening in Ukraine. So it was like, yeah, we need to go and change that. So we, we had to take that out. And like, you're welcome because everything's open source and we've got nothing to hide. Um, and we don't mind you laughing at our mistakes because that's how we learn. And I always think it's really positive when people say, oh, you should never type in demos. Uh, okay, keynotes, maybe. Don't time in demos. But if you don't see us doing mistakes, if you don't see that Yap the Awesome actually does sometimes mistype things and gets errors and has to debug them, then you're not going to know that that's what's going to happen for you, and you need to learn and do that. So come and have a look. You'll find our repo here. You can go through. We literally have a notes file there, which has all of our top highlights of things that we went wrong, you can go and find out. But it'll also show you everything about how we've done it. And if you've got code spaces yourself and you've forked the repository, 
And there's this yeah, code space to stop. Then you could try running in, starting the code space and just running and playing, and you will have exactly the same experience as everybody else. Pretty cool. So that's us. And nobody put their hands up and shouted and had any questions. Wait, so, there's a hand for a so shout. So there was a hand. I saw a hand. Hello, hand. Uh, I was wondering, so you mentioned that you had many people logging in using the demo. What was the cross-relate to that? How, how do they access that directly? Is it just a link from the browser? Um, so the question was, uh, what was the cost for this and how did they access this? So the cost is zero if they're not using code spaces. Right. So if you're using GitHub code spaces, then you know you talk to Yap. Yap will explain with great detail because he loves it about the difference between personal go code spaces and organizational code spaces and what the costs are. Because depending on how you do it, there is a there is a cost. Okay, but in general, if you just open up Visual Studio Code, as long as you've got Docker installed, so Docker is free, Visual Studio Code is free. Uh, we need to have the remote. Extensions. And I actually believe that in the readme of that repo, we've got kind of a step-by-step -step guideline of how to get this set up in your own environment. Um, hit all, like all the this. prerequisites. Yeah. Stop installing things for me. This remote containers extensions. And then you just open, this is a data grader one, but the same thing happens. So then you open up the repository locally and you can see here, Control one, oh no. It was there. Oh, uh, it was there. You can see here it says, hey, hey, I'm in a. Wait, whilst you're reloading, let's put Zoom it on, because we didn't realize we needed to have Zoom it running. Thank you. Thank you. So as it comes, and it comes here and it says, hey, this repo. It's got a dev container file. Do you want me to open it? It's because we've got up here our dev container with our dev container.json file. Are you on this? Yeah? Just reopen. And we reopen. It's just going to spin around. Docker's not running, but it would then just, just start Docker. Any more questions for any more? Nope. So, my friend, we have to choose the best question. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. There was, there was one, one question. I mean, there was only one person that asked a question. Nobody, asked, nobody else asked any other questions, did they? Did anybody else ask any other questions? Oh, did you ask a question? He says, no. I don't want your book. Would you like to put? Ah, okay. I, I promise I'll sign it for you. In my own special way. There we go. <laughs> uh, it, you, you, you'll have to video it. You'll, it will, it'll make sense. So, my name is Rob. This is Jess. If you have any more questions, you will find us about because, you know, hey, we kind of look the same. So, you know, we find one of us, it's probably the other one. <laughs> thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much.